Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> I'm here with P.J. DeRochers, a visual artist who explores their non-binary humaneness through art. P.J. creates images, builds installations, and immersive experiences of their gender and a life well lived. Welcome, P.J. Thank you, Anne. I'm happy to be here. This is a return visit. You last it came is a on return. Yeah. November 30th, 2019. And a lot has changed since then. I know <laughs> so much. Yeah. We've all been through a lot. Let me read from your artistic statement, if I may. Please their do. Media <clears throat> their media originates with photographic self-portraits printed on transparency film. PJ then builds creations by layering the transparent images and connecting them quite often using fingerprinted scotch tape and fishing line to found objects. These pieces can often be found installed within the natural beauty of central Vermont, where they photograph and film these beloved creations to become gallery accessible and presented for your viewing pleasure. <laughs> and in the last interview, just to have a little bio, I learned that you were born in New Hampshire, spent yes. some time in California, and have moved back to Vermont with your daughter to spend some time with your mother. Yes, correct. And Central Vermont is your primary uh, artistic venue. It definitely is. Um, one reason PJ has been kind enough to join us is to celebrate um, show that's currently at the front gallery called PJ DeRocher's To See and Be Seen. Now, this is going to be at the front gallery. I was privileged enough to go to the opening. It's a small gallery, and every inch of the space is used creatively. So when you go, you have to be really attentive to all the um, found objects, maybe, um, that appear. Um, you are going also, OK, so this is going to be up between November 5th and November 28th and 2021. Right. So this will give our audience plenty of time to stop in and see it. Uh, the only caveat is that the gallery is only open on weekends. So keep that in yeah. mind. Friday evenings. Visit. Yeah, Friday evenings from 4 <laughs> to 7, Saturdays and Sundays from 11 to 5. One other thing I'd like to alert the audience to is an upcoming artist talk that PJ is going to deliver on Thursday, November 18th at 7 p.m. And this is going to be a Zoom talk. Correct. And if you go on um, PJ's yeah. website, we will display throughout. You'll get the Zoom link. Yes. So I'm going to try to tune in. That should be very, maybe we can have a little preview on this show. Of your <laughs> art. That'd be great. Um, there are um, several continuities in your work that I have observed, but um, before we get to that, well, one is this deconstruction piece, because when you last came on the show, uh, I believe you presented it and it was a flat object. And let me read, if I may, a little description about it, and then we can show it in its new incarnation. And you could talk a little more about it if you would. I will. <clears throat> this is in your voice. Deconstruction, unbeknownst to myself at the time of building. Deconstruction was the exploration of my gender. I came to notice during my daily photographic process of seeing myself that the images I was taking had transitioned from being whole body and face portraits to images taken only of parts of myself. 
seeing only parts made me curious what I wasn't wanting to see or attempting to see within myself. I decided I'd build a full body image in the form of a map on my studio <clears throat> to see what I could see. The then abstracted, I then abstracted from these images and built a life-size mobile, 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 mobile. Mm -hmm. <laughs> made out of transparencies of each of the photographs to install in nature to seek a deeper understanding of what I was processing within myself at the time. Upon reflecting, as I made the work, I began to understand that I wasn't a woman. Indeed, I am a non-binary human, and this work reflected to me the deconstruction of my womanhood and redefined my gender in the spacious, light-filled land of being non-binary. I love that phrase. As you can see in the video that we're about to look at, the rigidity and fracturing of my womanhood juxtaposed with the fluidity and multi-dimensionality of my non-binary self. Let's look at this 22 second clip. That is so interesting. Tell us about it, PJ. <laughs> Add to your description. Um, well, I like hearing the words that I wrote a while ago. Um, and I think that they still ring true. Like I definitely had um, just right now a bit of a, like an emotional response to hearing them like reflected back to me. And um, I think that's, reflection is such a huge part of my art. And so when I made this deconstruction piece, I, I work to see in general, like I'm working to see, like, I just, I want to see what's going on. And so images, photographs, and ways to kind of take them and manipulate them really help reflect back into me like what's going on. So this particular piece I feel like opened me to, to understanding um, the non-binary landscape that had been seeking to be seen I think for quite a while, um, if not forever. Uh, there just weren't words for it um, when I was younger. So I, I guess I'm always pleased that um, I do take the time to pay attention. And I definitely looked through my photographs at that time when before I even built the image and was really interested to, as to why just you know, months prior, years prior, I would take full body images and why for about a six month period of time, I was only just taking like snippets of myself. Um, so it really was in that understanding of myself that something was going on and then making it into something was, was I able to have that reflection back that there was a part of me that was breaking down and breaking apart and that there was something to be found like kind of in a new terrain. I often describe my, my gender to me most often feels like a really vast expanse and uh, the concept of sort of, uh, or the trappings for me, which felt like, like a womanhood um, to have those sort of break apart and fall away has been really freeing. Um, and to really make art that is like not only like my experience of non-binary voice, but sort of creating um, openings for others to, to enter into my world and my understanding kind of, of, of gender, because gender really is your own understanding. Like, we get labeled certain things, but 
you know, I may look and appear a certain way, but it's really how I feel and define it for myself. And that is, you know, for everyone um, in general. Um, and I think like my, in my art, um, making this art and sort of like taking a stand about it, that I've decided that I'm going to be free in my own expression, that I hope that it has that impact for others and that it is an opening and a welcoming and a, and a, like a deeper, a deeper understanding. So that piece is very near and dear and so special to me. And that's why in my current show, I made a film of multiple installations that I did of that piece because I feel like the current work, um, the to see and be seen uh, show that's up at the front in Montpelier, Vermont and my show and like everything, like it feels like it started there. Like that feels like a starting point to me. So it's continuity and expansion. Yes. And yes. that theme is reflected also in uh, what seems to me a new project, a project I hadn't heard of yet, which is <laughs> non-binary tarot. Yes. Uh, it's also featured in the show. And yes. I, I read your description of it. And you know when you last came on the show, you told me about iPhoneography, which was a new concept I'd never heard. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. now a new concept I've never heard is soul tarot. So please mm -hmm. tell us, what is soul tarot? Well, so soul tarot is a concept that I learned from one of my teachers, Lindsay Mack. And Lindsay Mack is a beautiful soul and they're a beautiful teacher of... Um, they have a website, lindsaymack.com, and they teach a class called Tarot for the Wild Soul. And I love Lindsay's approach in that, which is very akin to my own approach and how I learned tarot as being a reflection of where you're at right now. And that in my 20 years of reading tarot, have I, I have never... Um, ever seen it as a way to like fortune tell only as a way to see so it's another way to see and have reflected and so I really resonated and learned so much from Lindsay around soul tarot because it's really just helping us grow and expand deeper and listen to kind of who we are beyond sort of who we're told to be and 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 here and and hold those parts that we were told to be as well. Like it isn't about being different. It's about being who you are and making choices on, on what you want to grow and what you don't want to grow. And so that would be my words for to describe Soul Tarot. And Lindsay may have completely different words. So I would just encourage folks to really check out their website and take anything that Lindsay offers if you're interested in in tarot or just in deeper listening to yourself? Well, when we came, when we left the show, one of the uh, people we'd gone to the show with remarked that the regular tarot is very gendered. Yes. So your idea of subverting that dynamic is really um, creative and original. Tell us how you happened to come upon the idea of a non-binary tarot. Uh, well, as a person that's non-binary and a person that has used Tarot as a self-reflective tool for 20 plus years, um, there's a labor that's involved when you read more gendered cards. And sometimes like a gender could feel really good. Like I really want to feel like kingly today or I feel more masked today. Like there's times that that fits. And sometimes it's just nice to have a space that is completely, I don't want to say like gender neutral, but you know that when you pick up my guidebook or when you pick up my cards, there, you, there isn't going to be an experience of being misgendered or hopefully there isn't. Um, and that's just something like as a non-binary person that I 
deal with daily. And I really like the idea of having my spiritual practice and my reflective time being a place where I don't have to make something fit for me, that this is just going to fit. And so my hope is that it has a fit for a lot of folks, whether, you know, I mean, specifically for like non-binary people, um, but for other people as well that are questioning or just are sort of tired of, of a traditional um, patriarchal sort of way of being, which tarot hasn't always been that way, but it has definitely merged in, into that. Um, so I, that's sort of where that came from, really, is just wanting a space where I don't have to correct anybody, where I can just be seen, and it, it deepens the practice for me. And that's, I mean, I'm just interested in understanding more about myself and interested in being able to be present in the in the moment with what is um, the more that I grow in age and I find the tarot really a beautiful way to that helps me hold space with things that are uncomfortable or things that I'm growing is that the deck displayed behind you yes it is so these are the original um the originals um these are uh, images that are printed onto transparency and then I hung them on the wall behind me as I completed each card and kind of each suit. So this is the completed deck that hangs behind me. And there's a printed version that's in my show and two prototype decks that are made, one that I use daily because I'm learning uh, this new deck and how it works, and one that I have for use in the show um, for folks to start getting some reflection from and for me to get some reflection from on kind of like how, how it works, what, what it's doing, how it's holding space, what kind of what the deck has to say as a whole because the cards are individual art but the way that it works together is it's a whole piece um and so that still is is emerging well you've sent us two individual cards to look at yes let's look at this first card it's death and the um what is the guidance the saying the epigraph is all good things come to pass, what's ready to take its leave. And this is the first card and you're, it's uh, seasonal, you told me. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little about that I mean, as we look at it? Yeah. Um, so the death card is actually the first card that I made for this deck. And I made it um, during this time of year, not last year, but the year before last. And um, I kept some of the major cards. I shifted some of the names around them and some of them I kept the same, um, more of the traditional name. And I, and I kept this name because I think that there is something really important about um, kind of honoring like what comes to pass and and sort of saying saying it like it is. And so in this card, you can see um, kind of embedded into the leaves, there is a, a shadow kind of of my back. So it, it does sort of talk about this card talks about the decomposition the the decomposing of what once was and then there's also an image of sort of 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 a rising up in the middle of the card and that both of those happen at the same time um and so this time of year fall is quite the death time of all the leaves coming down and coating the earth and being ready to be be composted but then there's also this level of vulnerability and exposure with that coming down like if you literally think of a tree and like what is 
what is being born or what's what's talking to you about wanting to be born. So I, I love this. I love the images in this card, but I also love the meaning of that, those two things happening at once, like the coming down and the laying down in the emergence in that. Let's look at the next card you sent us. This, you say this is your favorite card. This is and my favorite. Is time shatters matter, perspectives and beliefs we've outgrown. I love that too. Tell yeah. us about this card as well. So we this at. card is the 10 of windows and windows like in a traditional tarot suit, windows would be the suit of knives. And typically this card is pretty like traditionally pretty um lots of big swords stabbing someone in the back and the person is laying down and it's a very uh, 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 violent image um, and so I'm surprised that this is my favorite card to tell you the truth because in a in a traditional tarot I would have kind of a more of a pulled back response to that that imagery is challenging but what I like about this, this card is it captures that the ending and like the last breath, you know, because you can see the, the nine windows coming down. Um, and then there's this new emergence of, of sort of what's left. Um, so 10 cards have a lot to do with similar to the death card in that they um, talk a lot about like what's present and what's come to pass. And so there's something to me that I love about, there's some softness in that windows that I really love because those periods of time, we need a lot of softness. And we need a lot of care. And so I like the colors in that card, the pink door, like really reflect that care to me. And there's like a softness around the window and the, and kind of a letting go of those black shapes to me are a lot around like kind of those automated thoughts or ways we're supposed to think or ways we're supposed to feel. And so when I talk about like time shatters, brain matter, like I think about our brains and our brains just get stuck sometimes. And so this 10 card is a real like it's going to shake some of those loose. And so here, you know, we're going to see those, you know, kind of tumbling down. And, and that is an experience of like a 10 of windows experience. Well, one thing I noticed about the deck is that it also reflects continuity and expansion. There are golden portals, there are ribbons, there are chairs. Um, your work is continually evolving, it seems. Yes. What I, one of the things that I, I love is that this deck was waiting for me in my camera roll. So, and what I mean by that, and one of my, one of my teachers, uh, one of my photo, photographic teachers or photography teachers, Catherine Just would say, and that her teacher would say, um, Sig Harvey that um, our work is ahead of us. And so there is a way when we work that you don't really know like what it's about. Like, and I really trust that. So a lot of times when I work, I'm like, oh, I'm going to cut a golden circle and like pop it out on the snow because I, I can't stop thinking about it. So I'm going to go ahead and do a series on golden portals. And I and I'm like, oh, that's cool. That's fun. I'm having a great time. Like, and then to come to find out that Golden Portals actually was hanging out waiting to become one of the suits in this deck. So each of the suits in this deck represents a, uh, a, a body of work that I have done. I did a body of work with the chair, a body of work with the ribbons, the windows emerged out of another 365 project body of work. So I, these really feel like, I feel like this deck has been talking to me for a long time, 
before I even knew that it was there. And so when I decided, you know, a couple years ago that I was going to make one, it took me a while to get the, the, um, I don't know if get out of my own way or to decide that I was going to give myself permission to make it um, because a lot of the images have me in them. And so that part felt a little, um, that felt, uh, that was interesting to navigate through until I said, you know what, it's okay. That's where we're going. And everything, all of the, all of those images have all been in my phone, so to speak, like they've all been there. So a lot of the self portraiture, that's part of this are images that have been there or continue to be generated to be there to make this deck. So uh, it, to me, it really does feel like such a culmination of, um, you know, a good seven year cycle of, of work, of artistic work. E.J. DeRochers, thank you for your art and your vision and thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks, Anne, for having Hi, everybody, and welcome to All Things LGBTQ. I'd like to introduce K.C. Whiteley, who is an environmental activist here in Vermont. So, hi, K.C., how are you? Hi, how are you? Thanks for having me, Linda. Oh, yeah, this is great. So, um, just so the audience gets to know you a little bit, you aren't originally from Vermont. So where were you before Vermont? I grew up in Southern Pennsylvania, down by the Maryland line. Um, and I came up to Vermont for the, in college to be a canoeing counselor actually at a girls camp up in the North King, Northeast Kingdom at Lake Willoughby. And I fell in love with everything about Vermont at that point, the hiking and canoeing and, you know, the lakes, the rivers, all that. So I think that kind of solidified my, my interest and just my connection with the natural world that I'm, that's so important. Gorgeous. Yeah. I really and then when that. I got out of college, I moved back to that same area and I've been here ever since. So. So did I'm, you study environment or science in college? No, I was just, a, I was just a plain old English major. You know, uh -huh. you just read a lot. <laughs> so. So what drew you to environmental issues and, and your deep commitment to trying to improve people's lives in this area? Well, I think I, I think always since, you know, my, you know, early twenties, when I first came up here, I've always had a respect and sort of sense of wanting to protect and keep the natural environment pristine. And um, I think uh, the thing that really, I would say, kind of turned me into an environmental activist as an older adult was after, right after I stopped working full time about 10 years ago, there was a, um, a push to uh, bring tar sands oil, which is from Canada, which is a very abrasive uh, liquid down through the Northeast Kingdom, uh, reversing the flow of what was the Portland, Maine to Montreal pipeline. And I saw where it was going to go through in the Northeast Kingdom. And that's like the area where I lived in for 20 years. And I was like, oh my gosh, if we have a spill in Victory Bog, nobody's ever even going to know about it, you know? Yeah. So I got involved then. And that's how I got connected with an organization called 350 Vermont, which is like the state chapter of a national organization that was started actually by one of our um, really highly respected Vermonters, Bill McKibben, who lives in Ripton, Vermont, and has been a Middlebury professor uh, and a writer. He's been writing about this stuff since the 80s, about the danger that you know humans are causing to the planet. So I got involved with 350 Vermont, and um, I've been involved with them ever since. I'm on their board, and uh, we, I've been out to Fort McMurray, Alberta, where the tar sands are, for a peace walk with the indigenous people out there. I've been to Standing Rock. Um, so the environment and specifically protection of our water is very, very important to me. And, and now we get to the subject of what you've been focusing, of, focusing on of late, which is leche? Leche. 
AJ. <laughs> yeah. Tell our audience, I mean, like I said, I, I, I didn't know anything about this. Uh, I had no clue. Yeah. So I'm sure there are many people who do not. So if you just give us a, sure. a little bit of talk about what this is and yeah. how it's affecting Vermont's environment. Well, and don't feel badly if you have, don't know much about this because most people don't unless you're from a place where this has been a big issue. It's just starting to bubble up to the surface here in central Vermont and specifically in Montpelier. But leachate is, um, well, first of all, the um, Vermont has only one landfill and it's run by a obviously a private uh, business called Casella. And it's up in the Newport Coventry area. Um, and it sits uh, on the back bay of Newport where these where three rivers come in and feed the Lake Memphis Magog, which is a 31 mile lake that is mostly in Canada. Well, leachate is kind of the, it's the liquid juice, they call it garbage juice, that that accumulates when everything sort of drips down to the bottom of the landfill and they draw that off and they put it into big tanker trucks and they haul it off to wastewater treatment plants. Well, the problem is, is that there isn't any treatment. Well, first the problem is the leachate has a family of chemicals in it called PFAS, P-F-A-S's, and they, contain a lot of different toxins, but they are called forever chemicals because they do not break down in the environment. And in fact, they what they say is they bioaccumulate. So when they take this leachate, which has got lots of this toxic waste in it, to the land, to the to the wastewater treatment plants, it doesn't get taken out. It just gets discharged into whatever that body of water is that the treatment plant goes into. Now, in the case of Newport, it goes into Lake Memphis, basically. It goes into the Black River and the Barton River, which feed into the lake. And they have found PFAS up way up in Canada in, at, in Magog, which is the other end of the lake, 30 miles up. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that Lake Memphis Magog is the drinking water supply. Well, it's not the only problem, but it's the drinking water supply for over 170,000 Canadians. So you know, it's poisoning their water supply. So right now there is a moratorium on not taking any leachate because of this danger. The Newport treatment plant isn't taking any leachate and Essex, Vermont, which was another big receiver of the leachate decided last February or March, 2021, that they were no longer gonna take leachate be until there's some treatment to take it out of it because they're putting it into the Lake Champlain watershed. Now. At issue for us here in Montpelier is that we are taking a lot of this leachate and it's being dumped, it's being discharged. I shouldn't say dumped, it's being discharged after the organic materials are, are, are taken out. It's being discharged into our Dog River, which is just a little hop, skip, and a jump away from the Winooski River. So it's all going into the Winooski River and eventually down into Lake Champlain. Now, one thing they discovered up in Newport is that it took about two years, it takes about two years for that leachate, for the PFAS to travel that far up the lake with the lake currents or whatever. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a process that really needs to be monitored and we need to be testing uh, what the level of these toxic chemicals are in the leachate that we're discharging into our watershed, our Winooski watershed, but we're not. So Anyway, what I would like your listeners to know is that um, the Montpelier City Council is just sort of getting a handle on this issue and they are meeting next Wednesday to talk about an agency of natural resources draft discharge permit that would increase the amount of leachate that Montpelier is taking from 24,000 gallons a day to 60,000 gallons a day. That's more than doubling the amount of leachate. And the reason why we're, you know, they need a place to put this stuff. And two of their big receivers aren't taking any. Plattsburgh takes it. Um, and I believe Concord, New Hampshire takes it. So really Montpelier is left holding the bag for this. And I guess what I want to give my opinion about is that I feel like the state of Vermont should be responsible for what happens to our solid waste and not leave it up to a private for profit 
multi-million dollar company. That's their job is to make money. Um, and instead it's falling back to small municipalities like Montpelier to deal with this stuff. And really, I don't think, I think that's a bum deal. It's, it's, it shouldn't be up to just Montpelier to say, yes, we're gonna take all of this leachate from the state's only landfill. Um, I think I would like to see Montpelier draw a line in the sand like Newport and Essex have and say, we're not going to take any more leachate until there's a way to treat this stuff and make sure that we're not poisoning our waterways. Um, the, one of the things they found in Newport are fish that have been caught that have cancerous lesions on them. And we don't even know what the, is happening below, below us on the Winooski River in Montpelier because nobody's keeping track of any of this stuff. So, so is, is there a way to treat this now? There is not a proven, confirmed, safe way to treat it right now. There is research going into it, and, the, and, and President Biden's EPA is definitely working hard on this. Um, right now, there, there are different sort of test pilots that are going, that are, that are being tried, but there's no, um, one of the ways is to to find a way to dry the leachate and then store it in a compact way somewhere safe so it's not in the, anybody's waterway. But one of the problems with that is I think it requires incineration, which releases a lot of these toxins into the air. Now, there was a huge, big uh, front page article about what happens, what's happened in North Carolina with all of the uh, PFAS that have been discharged into the Cape Fear River and poison the drinking water supply for people down there. And they find, they found that like most of us, actually, when you get a blood test, we have some level of PFAS in our bloodstreams because of all the uses that it's had for like over 50 years. I mean, DuPont has been making this stuff since the 50s. It's in Teflon, it's in stuff that makes your raincoats um, water resistant, it's in firefighters foam that they use. There's a big problem on US military bases with trying to get rid of um, toxic PFAS on the, on the military bases and they're trying to deal with that. But anyway, it's, it's, um, it's not just a problem here in Vermont, but we have an opportunity to make sure it doesn't get as bad as things are other places like North Carolina. And that's why it's important for the Agency of Natural Resources to hear from people no, we don't want to expand. We don't want to expand the amount we're taking. We want to stop taking it. It's dangerous. And then, what, and then what would happen to it, though? I mean, is if if Malpelia refuses to take it, I, then I I think it just it it forces it's it puts a lot of pressure on the state to come up with a plan for what to do with it. Right now, in this draft permit, they're giving Casella the green light to pilot test a treatment plan up in Coventry. And of course, the people who have been fighting this up at Lake Menfer Magog are saying, no, we don't, we don't want you to do that here. In fact, we want you to, over you know, the next couple of years, we want you to shut down this landfill altogether. Yeah, yeah. So, well, that makes sense. So um, we, we so wanna put pressure on the state to take responsibility for this and take it off the shoulders of you know, relatively small communities who are strapped for cash anyway, like Montpelier. And we'll make sure to put up um, all of Vermont, uh, all of Montpelier's uh, council people. That would be and great. So, so our audience will know how to contact them to talk about this issue. And you Linda, people, that, people can people there's a zoom, people can zoom into these meetings too. So you okay. don't have to show up in person, and it's a particularly difficult time for people to want to be with a crowd of people. So. Um, so they would just go on to, so next Wednesday, what is the date for that? That's the 27th. That's, the That's 27th. October 27th. And then the night after that, there's an in-person meeting that the Agency of Natural Resources is hosting at their building out on the, I call it the Three Mile Bridge Road. It's out by the, um, it's out by the railroad station. It's called the Annex. Right. And they're having it. Okay. And you can zoom, you can zoom into that as well. Okay, so and I'll make sure you have uh, that information. Okay, great, and and um, so people can just show up and 
yeah. online if they want. I mean, uh, on Zoom if they want. Okay, great. That would and that so, would be really great if people could do that just to show that you know this isn't just a like check off the box and we're doing this. You know. I know. It's really important. Yeah. And, you know, water, drinking water everywhere in the United States. I mean, like Flynn. I mean, I think that was caused by a different issue, obviously, but yeah, you know, the water that they were putting into the water system was polluted. Yeah. Um, so, and you know, the answer to all this shouldn't be just to buy water in plastic bottles. It's like, yeah, we should have, we should have clean water to drink, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I, let me just ask you now, if our audience wants to read more, uh, read uh, on, up on these issues more and other issues. Do you have any books that you might suggest that people read? I have, I have two. And this one is, um, is called All We Can Save, Truth, Courage, and Solutions for the Climate Crisis. And one of the things I like about it is that it's written by two women scientists and the contributors are all women. And um, they're essayists and poets. And it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful, book in the sense that you're not going to be totally depressed <laughs> when you read it yeah. so yeah. and that's the trouble with like i mean you know and the, the planet right now is in such sad shape that it's hard to think about things globally and not get depressed so and then the other book i really like is this book called braiding sweetgrass by robin wall kimmerer and she is a a scientist and a professor and a member of the uh potawatomi nation over in new york state and this book is more about just what are we late, uh, like what a what an indigenous relationship with the natural world is, and it's reciprocal and it's not exploitive. And so she just she's a wonderful writer, and it's a it's just a it's I'd say it's almost more like a spiritually oriented book than um, scientifically about you know here's this bad thing and what you should do about it. Yeah, so I like I love those two books. I would recommend those two books. Okay, great. So let's all try to go to these meetings and zoom in if you don't want to go in person. Great. And, and um, is there anything else you'd like to tell the audience before we leave? No, I think that's I think that I mean for this for this particular issue, I think that would be you know we've pretty much covered like what why the what's the urgency of it. And it is really important. Yeah. So, okay. Well, thank you, Casey. Well, thanks for having me, Linda. This is a very timely opportunity to get the word out. And um, I'll see you on Zoom. Oh, great. Okay. All right. So anyone who is part of the Central Vermont LGBTQ community knows that there was an email that went out recently promoting a new LGBTQ plus affinity group that was coming together, sponsored by the UU Church. And it was entitled Queerality. Get your attention? So here to talk to us about Queerality and how it came about is Virtus Lavar Robinson, who is an intern at the UU Church in Montpelier. Welcome, Verdes. Thanks for having me. <laughs> th thank you for being here. Thank you for agreeing to do this. As I said before, this is an example of faith. So I think where I would like to start is talking a little bit about you, because you have a degree in voice. <laughs> you, you were associate professor tenured in history and African American studies. That's not necessarily the route that gets you to a master's in divinity and ordination. Yes. How did that happen? Oh, long story. I'll make it brief though, because um, I tell it a lot because everyone okay. asks that. And, and that is, uh, so I grew up in Western New York, which is uh, Rochester, so nowhere near, near, nowhere near the city. <laughs> it takes me the same time as to get to the city as it does to Vermont, believe it or not. 
So, uh, so Western New York, home of the snow, buffalo wings, all that great stuff. And I grew up in a holiness Pentecostal family. Um, and we, we were very um, poor. So it's a part of the Christian, the Protestant charismatic Christian um, faith that believes in speaking in tongues and dancing and um, as a way of rejoicing and things of that nature. So um, and all the gifts of the spirit and all of that. So I grew up, uh, my father was a Pentecostal preacher. Uh, my mother was a deaconess in the church. And uh, I grew up on the front row seat <laughs> since birth almost basically. And, um, and then in high school, so I got really, really involved. Uh, we were always in church, Wednesday night service, Thursday the night choir practice, Friday night, um, Terry service is what they call it to commune with the Holy Spirit. And then all day Sunday and evening, um, I was always in church. So, um, but then I started to come out to myself around, I wanna say uh, sophomore year or junior year. And in the Pentecostal faith and also in the um, African American community, um, homosexuality is not um, accepted. It's not welcomed. Um, and, um, but um, I was into musical theater at that time. So I was in the performing arts. So, you know, I felt very, very comfortable coming out to my friends, but not to my family. I didn't do that too much later. Um, so being in the performing arts, I ended up going into my into my first passion, which is music, always been music. Um, music is in my veins. Um, and so um, I got duped, <laughs> tricked into going into a conservatory in, in Boston University School for the Arts at the time. Now it's College of Fine Arts. But um, I was the only African American in my class. And, um, and there was very, very few of us who were doing classical music. So what prepared me for that, and one thing I did not tell about my journey, I'm trying to go through it very briefly because all these 43 years, it seems like done too much, um, was that I was bused from the, uh, from the, sets, from the um, urban populations to the suburban populations. So a lot of times I was the only African-American in my class. So I got used to navigating in those different environments, those different communities, going to church and, and a black community, going to school in a white community. So um, that led me into born and becoming an opera star. <laughs> All right. So I have a degree in music. Um, but then when I graduated, I grew up financially insecure and I was not going to be financially insecure in my adult life. And that's going into um, performing. So I did my second love, which was history. So I went back to school, got another bachelor's degree and um, went on to the master's degree. And then um, eventually um, found my way getting another master's degree in African-American studies because I didn't believe I got enough of African-American history and studies from my history degree. I didn't get any hardly. Um, and so I went back and while I was getting that second degree, I became a history professor at a community college. So you've touched on a number of things here that I want to sort of loop back to. Pentecostal, I'm, I'm familiar with yeah. the basic framework because there was actually a, a Pentecostal evangelical church in Plainfield, Vermont, when I was growing up. And I would attend some of the summer revival camps. The, the transition from that to the UU church. Oh, yeah, I can see it. Oh, yeah. Not. <laughs> mainstream religion really mm -hmm. doesn't treat LGBTQ plus parishioners all that well. How did you reconcile that within yourself mm -hmm. and then decide, I want to be a leader for people who are probably not that represented within our faith communities? Yeah. So uh, with that Pentecostal past and upbringing, and I came out and I was out in college, but I still had the fear of God literally in me. 
So that prevented me from becoming a part of any community or even being myself. So um, after, after that, I came back home and, you know, I was home. So, um, so I went back into the closet. Um, and anyone who had known anything about me, we just kept it hush hush, kept it secret. And so I changed the way I walked. I changed the way I spoke, yeah. unfortunately, in order to conform. And, um, and then I became a minister. I became a minister. Um, and I became a minister because I had this innate gil- skill for teaching. Like no one taught me how to teach, but I was very, a very effective teacher in, um, for college. And that translated very, very nicely into ministry. And I was called into the ministry the way that Pentecostals are called. <laughs> so I had a conversion and I had like this, 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 this spiritual event that said, okay, yeah, okay, I'm called into the ministry. And that's for my book. I'm saving that for my book. (laughs) Your own personal road to Damascus story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I was just like, and, you know, and when and when I started to really, really conform is when, you know, when everyone else is shouting in the church and they're leaping for joy, I I was left weeping. I was left weeping because I knew who I was and it was unaccepted. And so I would cry every single service, every single service as a minister. Um, So it got to the point where I was about to be engaged to a nice young church lady and our father who was also a Pentecostal preacher just loved me because we were the same height. I'm very short, you can't tell. But (laughs) Um, it just got to that point and I was like, I can't do this. I can't do that, this to her and I cannot do this to me. So um, I was about 30, <laughs> I was at 30 years old, my 30 year birthday. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. And I left the church and I tried to f- find my way around to liberal Christian churches, but there was something that was just like, look, if I'm going to abandon my church, abandon my ministry, why don't I start from scratch? Do I believe in God? <laughs> Do I believe in Jesus? Do I believe in, you know, what is this I was learned all this time and I'm now I'm leaving it behind me to create who I am and live in my own um, skin and be and love me for me. But I need but I need a religious um, community to affirm that, to say that it's OK. And that was the UU church for me. And um, yeah, and it was just one service, just one service, the first service I attended. And someone had um, from the pulpit, um, they were interim minister and had made a anti-Christian joke. And I was like, okay, this is not the place for me. (laughs) You know, (laughs) like say a joke, Christian joke at the pulpit. You know, I thought this was like an inclusive church. You know, I see crosses and stuff like that and St. Paul, you know, you know, on the windows. But, you know, now they say anti-Christian joke that has to do with history. But that's another conversation of the UU church. But um, but in coffee hour, I had make I had made a joke. Um, There was like a a lot of there were some church ladies that were around and that made a joke that, you know, because because this this older gentleman had asked me, he was like, are you gay? And I was like, okay, really? I'm in a church in the coffee hour. And this elderly elderly gentleman said, you know, one of my elders asked me if I was gay. And you know what I said? You know what? Yep, I am. Let's just see what he would say. I was going to say nothing like the opening volley in this new community of faith is challenging everything that got you there. (laughs) And, And... Thank you so much for identifying coming out at 30, because I think that there are people from within the LGBTQ plus communities, you know, that don't, that are reluctant to talk about what it took for them to get to the point where they could come out, but you reclaimed your life in a very positive manner. Yeah. So You've been at the UU Church here in Montpelier for about a year. You had shared that it's a two-year internship. 
queerality. Yeah. Why now? And what yeah. was the prompt to start this? Well, it was one thing about the church that I come from, and this this goes into why I'm doing this now. And at that, you know, there was a um, a pride flag in front of, of of the church, and I was like, okay, I feel welcomed. But it wasn't until that coffee hour that I felt affirmed. You know, I had mentioned that I was gay, and then the and then I had you know jokingly told the um, the church ladies that you know my previous religion told me that. I had a ticket to hell and that you know, I had a demon evil spirit in me. And I started laughing and they were just like, <gasps> so each one of them grabbed me and held me. This is pre COVID, but they held me and they started whispering in my ear affirmations. Each one of them did that. And I just wept, I just broke down. And then from that moment, I was like, okay, I'm going on this journey of healing, trying to heal. And that's what queerality is about. It's about that because we like to do and go for our, our sexual identities here and our spiritual identities over here and they never mingle. We never want to do that. Even when I was doing my learning and service agreement for my internship, I left anything about LGBTQ out and my committee was just like, wait a minute, how come you let you put BIPOC stuff? You, you know, you put everything else, but you left. L I mean, even you know, subconsciously, I was doing it, and I was like, you know what? Now was the time. Now was the time to say, yep, you're queer and you're a spiritual being. Yes, you're queer, you're lesbian, you're gay, you're transsexual, you're bisexual, you're questioning, and everything else intersex, all of that, asexual, and you are loved. And that gave me the ability because I had that, that moment and, and that journey for 13 years to be like, this is essential. My first sermon as a lay person because I didn't have the credentials to be a minister and the UU church, that's why the MDiv, you know, is that my first sermon was this church saves lives. And it's not just the church. It was not that it was that the fact that they welcomed me, but not just that, because a lot of churches welcome people, but are they going to affirm? Are they going to say that you're loved? Are they going to say that we'll, we're holding you? We may not understand, but we love you and we care about you. And we're going to try to understand as best as we can. We're going to try to be empathetic. We're going to try, we try, try. At least that goes to some type of action. And so this church, the Unitarian Church of Montpelier is a welcoming congregation. You see its, its pride flag and now the progress flag. Just came new, new progress flag blowing in the wind every single day, rain or shine, along with the Black Lives Matter flag. And we're proudly, proudly saying, you, you can come in. You're a BIPOC person, you can come in. We are a queer person, you can come in. But not only that, but we will affirm you. And this is what queerality is all about. So I want to thank you for your personal journey that's continuing your efforts to reclaim your life and truly integrate it and being willing to take us along for the ride. <laughs> so with that, thank you. Good luck with the new Queerality Group. I'm gonna check back in with you in a couple of months and see how it's going. Yes, yes. So, and, and good luck on your spiritual journey. Thank you. It's a journey that, that I'll keep on going at it and it's keeping me alive day to day and just meeting great folks like yourself is affirmation enough. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist.